already heard that that this is being recorded. So if you have any concern, please let us know. Uh, you can put it in the chat uh, or or just raise your hand. So welcome everyone, and thank you for joining the GRSS webinar hosted by the Earth Science Informatics Technical Committee. My name is uh, Manil Maske. I work at NASA and also chair the Earth Science Techn Informatics Technical Community Committee. And uh, I would like to introduce today Dr. Elena Simpro and uh, Dr. Rajat Shinde. Um, we will be talking about uh, some standards that uh, has been evolving over the past year or so called COSA, and you'll have more, hear more details about that as we go along. Let me introduce Elena first. She is a professor of computer science and deputy head of Department of Enterprise and Engagement in the Department of Informatics at King's College London. Well done. Quite a mouthful. <laughs> She's also the director of uh, research for the Open Data Institute, uh, a fellow of British Computer Society and the Royal Society of Arts. Um, she has quite a few publications. Uh, as you Google uh, her, you'll find it um, on, on many different uh, topics, including uh, what I'm interested in, semantic webs and knowledge engineering. Um, Rajat, on the other hand, is a computer scientist working at NASA's uh, Interagency Implementation and Advanced Concepts team, or, or in short, IMPACT. And he's also a researcher at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. He has a PhD in geoinformatics from Indian Institute of Technology in India. And uh, recently he's been leading some NASA projects uh, uh, that spans data systems, uh, AI, foundation model work, uh, mostly from the data centric perspective. Uh, and he is also a co-chair of one of the working groups under the Earth Science Informatics Technical Committee that focuses on uh, foundation models from the data side of the things. Okay, um, so the flow will be, uh, I'll introduce briefly the technical committee and what we do within the GRSS, IEEE GRSS. And then we'll, um, I'll hand it over to Elena, give some perspective on the croissant and then Rajat will drill down into the geo croissant part. Um, okay, let's start. Uh, next slide. Rajat, you have the, yeah, okay. This, I'm sure everybody here knows about IEEE. Uh, we are the biggest, uh, the largest academic and professional society with about, I think it's a little bit outdated, 430,000 plus members in uh, 160 countries. Here you see some snapshots of some publications that we support. Next slide. So uh, within, um, IEEE, there are many societies, and the society that we are part of it is the Geosensing and Remote Geosciences and Remote Sensing Society. We have about 5,000 members over 94 different countries. It's completely volunteer based. Uh, uh, we focus on Earth processes, uh, looking at from different perspectives from science, technical, engineering, data, everything. Uh, the type of work we do is completely volunteer based. We and we do that by supporting chapters, local chapters, student chapters, very active, and um, and something called ambassadors all over the world as well. Next slide. Uh, you can yeah, I can go through that. So these are some of the things we do. Right, we have publications, we have conferences. Uh, one of our flagship conferences is the IGARS, that happens in summer, and professional activities. Uh, some uh, mostly focused on developing workforce, networking, a lot of educational activities that we support. And uh, for today's uh, discussion, we'll drill down a little bit on the technical activities. Next slide. Oh, so this is my obligatory slide. Uh, this is, again, if you're interested in uh, finding out more or subscribing to newsletters, please, here are the QR codes. Next. Slide. We'll, we'll have the slides available for all the participants afterwards. So most of the technical work is done by something called technical committees. Uh, we have eight of them right now. Again, volunteer uh, committees. We are part of the Earth Science Informatics uh, Technical Committee. You, as you see, there are uh, image focus, uh, remote sensing in terms of frequency focus. There are standards for Earth observation focus, and many of them, right? Uh, and uh, I think there may be some additional one coming up in the future based on 
the evolution of the technology. Next slide. So this is the leadership uh, team at the technical committee level. Uh, our goal is to share knowledge, bring people together and experts in this area. Um, and it, the, the scope changes as the technology changes, uh, but the idea is that we are all aware of uh, advancement in this field, bring them together in many different set settings, uh, including the webinar like today. Next slide. Drilling down even uh, further, uh, there are focused working group that focus on certain topics. And we have three of them within the, uh, this technical committee. One is completely focused on databases for remote sensing, uh, both traditional and, and evolving uh, type of databases. Uh, there is computing aspect that uh, another team or working group focuses on. It's on looking at technologies and how computing technologies including uh, high performance computing, cloud computing, quantum computing, and how that can be used to advance earth applications. And one of the newest form working group is the working group for foundation model and digital twin. And that's where Razak leads the uh, data centric aspect. Next slide. Uh, this is a little bit more detail in terms of what are considered, what are the uh, elements within each of these uh, sub uh, teams that uh, we have under the foundation model and digital twin working group. It includes data, it includes uh, standards, it includes training, uh, because the paradigm is shifting in terms of how we do AI with foundation models. So there's a training aspect of that. They do summer schools, tutorials along the way. Uh, one of the things that's also responsible here is the ethical and responsible AI practices for our scientists, teaching them how to do this uh, ethically and responsibly so that uh, uh, we we are following the best practices that are coming out of uh, several of the things, including what uh, Elena does in terms of her group. Next slide. So yeah, if you're interested in any of that you heard, uh, this is the link to join. Um, and again, everything we do is in the open, uh, including the presentation today and recording will also go in the YouTube uh, channel that uh, we have on, uh, under the GRSS umbrella. I think that's my last slide, if I'm not mistaken. Next slide. Yeah. So maybe I'll hand it over to Elena. Excellent. I am, I have my own slides, yeah. which I will try to share now. Let's see. I'll press the share button, and then I'm saying this, and then I'm doing share. Uh, it says you're screen sharing, and that says, okay, let me just move these windows around a little bit. Excellent. So people can see my screen, yeah? Yes. All right. That's great. Um, yes. So um, very happy to be here. Um, just to um, frame a little bit what we are, we're talking about. Um, we are talking about a um, technical standard um, or an emerging standard. We're talking about a um, vocabulary to describe data sets that are used in AI models and systems. Um, so when we talk about AI in this context, we do mean mostly machine learning. Um, so when we talk about the data that is related to machine learning, we talk about data sets used for tasks like um, training and, and, and fine tuning. Um, but we're also um, talking about data sets like uh, benchmark data sets and the way they are created. Um, we are talking about um, collections of prompts um, and, and uh, many other uh, data artifacts. And the idea, the general idea is that we want to um, be able to have well-governed data sets in um, AI development, uh, just like we have responsible data practices in other areas in software engineering or computer science. So the work I'm presenting is 
is um, run in a organization called ML Commons. So ML stands for machine learning. Um, this is an organization um, that is entirely member driven. Uh, it was founded in 2018. Um, you have here um, the list of, of, of the founding members, um, which are very much um, household names um, that uh, in the technology space, uh, but also an increasing number of, of, of members, so more than 125 um, to date from, from all over the world. Um, there's also many contributors from academic institutions, and this is just a short list of, of, of examples that um, should basically tell you um, there's a whole range of uh, universities um, and research institutes from all over the world um, that contribute to ML Commons activities. Um, ML Commons uh, is organized in working groups um, there is a strong focus on developing data sets, in particular benchmark data sets, and the benchmark tools that are required to achieve systematic progress in, in, in the field. Um, individual academics like myself can contribute at no cost to most activities. So one can join groups, working groups, one can chair um, particular tasks or, or working groups. Um, and institutions can join both as members um, for a fee and, and, and affiliates. And the whole endeavor is really um, entirely community uh, funded. Within this um, uh, setting, uh, I am um, one of the co-chairs um, of the working group uh, on Croissant, uh, which looks at standardizing metadata um, about AI uh, or machine learning data sets. And the other co-chair is Omar Benjelun from um, Google. Um, both of us have a background in in semantic technologies and 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 and, and linked data. Um, so those are uh, for those who are less familiar technologies that are used to um, publish data, any data, whether related to um, machine learning, engineering, or or not. So publish data uh, in a way that makes it easy for others to to use it. Um, I see there's something in the chat, but I'm not going to be able to open it. So if this is something that I should be addressing right now, then um, maybe Rajat and Manuel, you could let me know. But going back to croissants, so what we would want to have is for machine learning data sets to be described in a machine readable way, in a standardized way as well. Um, this format is that we're proposing is, is, is open. Um, so anyone can contribute to it. Um, and it is based on web standards for data publishing. Um, what does that mean? Um, well, um, at the core, there is a, it is based on a standard called schema.org, um, which is a XML or, or JSON based vocabulary uh, that is used to add machine readable structured markup to web content. In particular, you see it at work um, every time you, you search online. So for instance, a business could um, add structured markup uh, to key pieces of information on its web page uh, that the Google search engine and other search engines could uh, should, should pay attention to. Uh, for instance, the name, the opening hours, and other types of information that people typically search for. And then when when those searches happen, um, the search engine can has is using that structured markup uh, to provide the answer to the information uh, rather than uh, relying on, on neural retrieval or other technologies to, to, to deal with those key facts. So um, that schema.org um, standard um, that we build on um, means that every data set that is annotated with croissant metadata with that structured markup um, can be found exactly in the same way as um, a web document um, by uh, technologies typically used by, by search engines. And that helps um, 
publisher. So if you um, want, if you've invested a lot of time in creating a data set and you want others to find it, um, then then building on this technology stack um, will, will achieve that. It also helps build um, better uh, discovery tools for finding uh, relevant AI data sets. Um, Croissant does a few of other things as well. Um, in particular, one of the main concerns that motivated the work on the on the uh, schema in the first place was this realization that um, we need to reduce friction um, when using data sets across different machine learning tools and, 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 and platforms, which are not entirely interoperable. So if we're thinking back in the day of how hard it used to be to open a text document between word processors on different platforms, this is more or less the equivalent of what we have right now in machine learning. And um, this croissant metadata that's added to machine learning data sets can, can, can help with that. On the right hand side, you have a a summary of of um, what croissant is 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 about and where uh, you would expect to to um, find or create this sort of uh, metadata. Um, and I'm just going to go through the next slides where I explain some of these components in 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 more detail. As I said at the beginning, like for every machine learning working group, this is an open group. And uh, so if you go to mlcommons.org slash croissant, um, you'll find a button to, to, to join us if you're if you're interested. So what does the vocabulary entail? Well, there's four different um what we call them layers, um, four four groups of attributes. Um, first we have general information um about a data set, um, as well as some uh, more specific attributes that uh, account for the fact that this is a machine learning data set that we're talking about. So um, by that, I mean something like splits and features and, 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 and labels, but also as part of a, an extension of the core vocabulary, we have a number of, of responsible AI attributes, which those of you who, who are working with machine learning data sets um, may have encountered in um, so-called data cards or or data sheets, um, which we process in a in a machine readable way um, to facilitate various types of of, of um, automatic services. So besides metadata, um, the standard uh, includes attributes that describe the source data, organized as files and sets of files. So in a machine learning data set. Um, you have uh, single files, uh, or you may have so-called file sets that are organized, that are directories um, or sets of, of um, files in the same format. Um, we also um, capture some information about the structure of the uh, files um, alongside some, with some basic data manipulation um, uh, techniques to navigate that, that, that structure. Um, and then we have one layer which um, we call uh, machine learning semantics. Um, so that's machine learning specific data interpretations for interoperability. Um, for instance, including custom types like bounding box and, and, and the way data is organized and trained and test splits and so on and so forth. Um, so it's particularly this fourth group of attributes um, that facilitates interoperability when supported by machine learning tools and platforms like uh, TensorFlow, OpenML, and PyTorch, um, who are all involved in the in the working group. Um, there's an um, open uh, spec uh, that we have published in March this year. Um, probably we expect version two to, to come out in Q1 next year. Um, and if you have a look at our uh, Git repository, you will also see um, not just the the, the spec um, in JSON LD, but also examples of of data sets annotated uh, with these attributes. So I said a bit earlier a few things about the the main use cases for Croissant. Um, I'm going to start with how Croissant helps someone who um, is looking for a data set to um, use or to repurpose um, in a machine learning project. Um, because 
of the way croissant is designed and its close ties to schema org um, uh, and, and the technology stack um, that 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 is supported by um, all major search engines um, all data sets that have croissant annotations or structured markup um, are automatically indexed by Google dataset search. Um, so it doesn't really matter whether you put your data set in a open repository or on your website. Um, if you have that metadata, then uh, Google data search would be able to index and, and you and others will be able to find it. Um, then um, the working group also includes representatives from major repositories where pe people would also go to look for datasets in addition to searching for them using search engines. Um, so um, Kaggle, Hugging Face, OpenML datasets, TensorFlow datasets, all of them um, support croissant. Um, and then finally, um, so if we're talking now less about finding the data um, and we're talking more about working with a particular data set, as I explained earlier, um, Croissant allows one to basically um, use a data set across multiple um, um, machine learning frameworks without the need to reorganize uh, that data. Now, if you're a data publisher, um, then we uh, have built a number of tools. Um, so we have a Python library that you can find in our Git, uh, Git repo, um, where not only we can create um, all the relevant attributes programmatically, but you can also use that library to um, uh, validate, manipulate, and convert data sets. Um, and we have a visual editor where you can um, create and modify data sets and, and automate some of the um, attributes as well as um, get recommendations on how to improve the, the metadata. Um, I've mentioned that we're working towards version two, which should be out um, by the end of March next year, hopefully. Uh, so there's a number of things that we're we're looking at. Um, in particular, we want to expand on on some attributes that the community have told us um, they're very important, both uh, when it comes to searching for data sets, but also making sense of a date of an existing data set and deciding whether to use it or not. And and one class of such attributes is related to uh, where the data comes from and 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 that data journey, so provenance and lineage, um, as well as richer richer machine learning metadata. Whether that means um, uh, predefined taxonomies of machine learning tasks or 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 other attributes. Um, we're also very keen to support uh, multilinguality, in particular um, with an eye on various uh, data sets in, in uh, natural language processing, including under resource languages. Um, and finally, um, Croissant is one tool to, to, to document data sets to increase the transparency um, of, of um, data and NAI processes. Um, and as such, in some cases, for instance, when it comes to to uh, safety data sets, um, there are uh, requests from the community to be able to annotate not just the data set as a whole, so a collection of, of, of files, but actually to be able for specific records within those data sets um, to, to um, add qualifiers, to add additional information about how those records were, were, were created. And orthogonal to all these, to these four components, which will result in, in, in new or revised attributes uh, in that schema, uh, we're also looking at how we could support the reuse of existing ontologies and vocabularies um, so that when others, for instance, in particular domains or for new use cases, want to add new attributes, that we have a modular um, uh, mechanism to, to, to do so. Um, this is, I think, the first paper we've published on Croissant. Um, this was published at the SIGMOD, that's database conference for those who don't know, uh, workshop earlier this year, um, and basically gives a much better summary of Croissant than what I've just did. 
Um, but I did mention extensions. Um, so these are meant to address areas of concern related to specific domains and use cases. You're going to hear about GeoCroissant in a second. Um, we're also working on an extension um, for, for health data sets. So one of their main concerns there is the fact that the data itself is very often not shared in the public domain. So the metadata record plays a, a, a very different role. And also there's a number of additional um, attributes um, that, that are important when we're using the data uh, um, in an ethical way. For instance, the way the data was collected and the degree to which um, a patient consent, consent was obtained, as well as various anonymization techniques that might have been applied. Um, and finally, we have an extension that looks specifically at responsible AI use cases uh, that could be served by um, machine-readable structured markup, um, things like automated compliance, now um, a concern with, with emerging regulation and in Europe, in, in, in the UK probably in, in a few months as well, and in other parts of the world. Um, and many other use cases like safety testing and so on that that um, uh, fall into this into this area. And there's a paper on our archive as well um, that uh, summarizes our thinking um, around this 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 third extension. And with that, I'd say join the working group. Um, and I'd like to thank Pat, Peter Matson and the rest of the working group for for providing most of the material. And I will stop sharing and hand over to Rajat. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Simple. This was a great introductory talk. And I hope you all can see the screen. Yeah, we can see it. It's not in presentation mode yet, but maybe. Uh, yeah, I'm trying I'll let to you know. Do that. Okay, uh, how about now? All right, yeah, great. All good. Great, thank you. So yeah, I uh, am Rajat Chagai. I work for NASA Impact in uh, Huntsville and also for University of Alabama in Huntsville. And uh, thank you, Elena, for giving uh, such a nice introduction to Croissant and also to uh, Manil and Jerika for uh, moderating the session and all of you for joining in. So I'll start with the Geo Croissant. And while I'm talking about it, I want all of you to remember three things. One is why we are doing it. Second is why is it important? And third, uh, who is doing it? So, and at the end, I'll summarize it again. Uh, so yeah, let's start with that. And we have a brief understanding of what Croissant is and why metadata is important. So just touching upon what Elena just mentioned and having some features. So Croissant as a framework is useful for all the machine learning practitioners in the machine learning ecosystem, right from the users to publishers to data creators and uh, educators as well. And talking about that, it has several different, uh, it has been designed with considering several different uh, features which are important, uh, such as download, search, create, and load. And you, you are seeing some snippets of it on the screen right now. One big advantage and one big uh, functionality which Croissant provides with respect to domain-specific implementations is coming from the modular extensions. And I would be touching upon that part. So uh, along with Croissant, Croissant Responsible AI uh, extension is already published and the specification is online. But right now the work is being done for the geospatial part and Croissant for health. And now we'll be discussing why there is a need to have uh, meta a good metadata description for all these geospatial machine learning data sets, which are uh, important. I, yeah, uh, Manil, I see your hand raised. Oh, sorry for the interruption. I'm sorry, that was by accident. Sorry, I wanted to click the chat button. <laughs> no worries at all. Yeah, so, okay, let's continue. So for the geospatial data sets, when we talk about data, we see that a lot of data is already available and a lot of data is being tracked on a daily basis. So this is a slide which showcases the entire operating and future science fleet uh, for uh, 
throughout the Earth observation, and we see that the Earth observation data, which is being tracked and collected, is enormous. And having said that, when we talk about modeling such a data, it becomes a mammoth task and not 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 at all possible for any human limits. So this is specifically related to NASA Earth Feet, which is, and you, you can see some famous uh, Earth observation data sets here, which you have been using uh, for your scientific analysis and scientific discovery. But uh, when we talk about machine learning uh, modeling, or when we see how these foundation models and large language models, uh, which are, or multimodal models, which are coming up, to use this data set for scientific applications where we are trying to automate or generate insights which are not visible uh, directly, then it becomes important to have certain workflows and certain ways where you can describe these data sets. And in such a scenario, metadata plays a very important role. Uh, reason being, these data sets are being stored in data stores which are directly or um, not accessible because of authentication issues or some provenance responsibilities. And once you have to, uh, and again, the size of data is so big that you cannot directly download it and start working on it. So it becomes important to have a workflow-based scenario where uh, you can directly use the metadata and point it to the location where the data is already stored. So these are a few things which uh, we are planning, uh, which is designed as a part of core uh, croissant specification, but it misses some things which are specific to the geospatial domain or earth observation domain. And that is where geo croissant is being uh, heading towards as a new uh, metadata standard or specification. So highlighting the points, like why do we need better metadata description or where does geo croissant come into the picture? So we need to understand that uh, there is a need for consistency and integration. So when I'm talking about consistency, it means that uh, the workflows which are being used for converting raw earth observation data to machine learning ready data sets, we need to have more consistent scenarios so that it is, it is not, uh, I mean, definitely versioning can be there, but consistency will enable that you are having a standard approach and when we talk about integration, so right now, if you will see the Earth observation data sets uh, or Earth observation machine learning ready data sets to be specific, are uh, something which are not very much connected to conventional machine learning uh, approaches which are being used. So there is a gap between these two communities and uh, with such a common metadata standard which can be extended further, we are seeing an opportunity to bridge that gap. Bias detection and mitigation is something which is always relevant. Geographical biases are uh, always there with respect to uh, the machine learning ready data sets or raw satellite uh, data sets as well. And uh, now coming back to data quality and model training. So with GeoCrossor, we also plan to look into how data quality attributes can be added. And some of these are already there in the responsible AI extension. So um, those can be used uh, here. And then, yeah, so reproducibility and accessibility. When we talk about Earth observation data, uh, the data repositories are big and you cannot work or you need a lot of computational resources to work on the entire data repository or entire data. Set. So with that in mind, there is, uh, there is development going on with respect to cloud optimized uh, cloud optimized data access, and this this is catered towards reproducibility and accessibility. Uh, we we covered the responsible GeoAI aspects, so which is uh, aligning with the responsible AI goal of developing AI systems responsibly and using AI systems responsibly, which also means that using AI systems responsibly with respect to data which is being used for training or fine tuning uh, those systems. And then, yeah, definitely gap in non-standardization. That is why uh, the uh, metadata standard for machine learning ready data sets. And I will be focusing on machine learning ready data sets here so that we don't, uh, we don't have a notion that we already have standards from a long time in earth observation domain as well. And why are we reinventing the wheel? 
So this effort is right now focused more towards machine learning ready data sets and then also integration with other existing uh, vocabularies. So coming from Earth observation domain, we all know that the Earth observation data sets has their own complexities. So I'll not touch upon all these things here, but we can see mostly uh, the data sets have different resolution, different spectra, which they uh, they are capturing, different wavelengths, which they are trying to capture. Then sensors are calibrated differently. We have noisy uh, values in the data, which are available because of uh, the operationalized uh, platforms. There is a heterogeneity, which means that uh, you cannot use one single source uh, for your analysis, you need to have multiple sources for validation, for calibration, and which increases uh, heterogeneity, in, uh, heterogeneity here. Up, uh, along with that, scalability is something which is also very challenging. So scale is huge in Earth observation data sets, and uh, it becomes very important when you are talking with respect to modeling. Plus uh, privacy and ethical concerns. So certain geospatial data sets have their own legal restrictions. And uh, these are the complexities with our observation data sets. And most of these are uh, covered by most of the types of geospatial data sets. So this is just a introductory slide and most of us are aware of it. So there are different types of geospatial data sets which are readily available and which can be directly used for our analysis, like multi-band or multi-spectral images, which is having somewhere around 10, uh, 10 bands or so, or hyperspectral bands, which can have which can have information related to more than 200 or 300 uh, wavelengths in a particular image. And then we have in-situ observations, which are point observations, and uh, which are collected on ground or on oceans. And these observations make it really important to uh, combine with the satellite images which have a global scale as compared to a local information which is being collected by those points. And uh, the citizen science data sets is a big source of information which is being coming in for, uh, and it is more uh, updated rapidly as compared to uh, other sources as well. And it, it gives you on-ground information. So with all these complexities and the types of geospatial data sets, it becomes challenging to directly convert raw data sets into your machine learning workflows or for using it as AI ready data. Uh, here I'm showing one example for how the HLS, uh, HLS data, which is uh, harmonized lands at Sentinel-2 data set, was used for training the geospatial foundation model, which also goes by the name of Prithvi. And it has several downstream applications. And uh, all of these data sets were curated uh, with effort and then the modeling was done. So uh, the point here, which I was trying to emphasize on us, uh, like getting raw data to be ready in AI ready format for Earth observation domain is challenging and uh, involves a lot of complexities. So uh, we did touch about schema.org and we also looked into a little bit of features of how uh, the ge geospatial data sets are being used. Now, with that in mind, we can come up with certain characteristics or certain unique characteristics, which uh, which can be relevant to go into me metadata for any Earth observation machine learning ready data sets. And these characteristics would uh, cover most of the uh, challenges which we have, challenges like biases, or are there any geographical bias in the data set? Or how was the data annotated? So if the data was annotated, like what's the annotator demographics behind it, if it is manually annotated? And then uh, values like what is what was the mode of acquisition? Or is it a nighttime data or daytime data? So uh, that will lead to what kind of atmospheric correction you need to do. And then also, what was the type of sensor? So are you doing it automatically? The data is being collected automatically by sensor platforms, or it is being done uh, by handheld sensors. So with that in mind, uh, the implementation started with mapping these unique characteristics with the schema.org properties or features, uh, properties or attributes. And uh, 
this is what the GeoCrossfire implementation entails. So this is kind of ca uh, mapping the unique characteristics of geospatial or Earth observation data sets to schema.org relations or properties. And this is how we can already do it. So resolution, uh, what's the spatial resolution of the data set, what's the spectral resolution of the data set can be defined with respect to schema.org properties. And this will go as a part of the Crossau representation or geo -Crossau representation. So for example, if you can see the data set provider information is available uh, as a part of REI extension already and the location related attributes can be covered in the GeoCrossau. So, uh, but yeah, just to clear the doubt, it does not mean that there will be separate files or separate metadata for all the machine learning ready data. So there will be one common CROSSAW file or JSON LD file, which you can use as a metadata description and it will entail different uh, attributes coming from different extensions. And that is where the uh, advantage comes in. So yeah, talking about extension, GeoCrossa extension. So there are some core uh, and REA extension representations, which are directly not representing the metadata for geospatial or other observation data sets as of now. So this extension is being developed with that in mind. Uh, so questions which we are targeting are something like, how do we deal with nested data attributes or hierarchical data formats? something like NetCDF or HDF5 file formats, which are highly relevant and high, widely used for Earth observation data sets. And with the cloud native approach coming into picture, how do we incorporate these attributes into metadata workflows? Then I already talked about uh, geographical biases and region restricted data access, which means if there are data stores like DAX, which store a lot of data. Oops, something happened. Uh, yeah, uh, I hope everybody we can, can see still, this. We screen. can still see the screen. It says GeoCrossant extension. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Elena. And uh, yeah, so I was touching upon the fact that the data repositories uh, and compatibility with metadata attributes, it is something which we are targeting. And one biggest attribute is uh, data fusion opportunities. So how do we combine structured and non-structured data with the, within the Earth observation domain for doing our analysis. Uh, yeah, quickly skimming through the community-driven use cases. So as part of GeoCrossau implementation, the group has been uh, discussing about what are the use cases which we want to look into. So uh, these two I have already discussed a bit. There is one interest uh, interesting use case coming from the space weather data sets. So a lot of the collision avoidance uh, problems uh, align with the Earth observation platforms. And um, that is a use case which the GeoCrossau would be addressing. Apart from that, describing data biases and diversity is something which is very important for Earth observation data sets as well. And one big challenge would be how to uh, make this metadata standard interoperable with other data formats and repositories and vocabularies. Uh, because in Earth observation domain as well, the uh, geosemantics and uh, the ontologies have been developing from a long time. And it, it is challenging to touch both of these uh, concepts as a part of uh, the shared vocabulary approach or uh, something. Uh, Elena mentioned a very good point in the presentation, which was about search and discovery. And with Earth observation machine learning data sets, that becomes relevant as well. So, how do we uh, do a efficient search is something uh, we are looking forward to address by GeoCrossau extension. I think uh, with respect to time, I will cover this uh, briefly. So the responsible AI part, which is being covered as a part of RAI extension, has also objectives which cover uh, GeoCrossau extension. So in geospatial domain, when we talk about machine learning, uh, there are certain features uh, which are important from responsible AI. And this is a paper which you can look into for more details. Uh, yeah, so I'll come back to this as a use case example in some time. But before that, uh, you might be thinking like, okay, where's the example? So here is an example which shows how a metadata format will look like 
for the HLS, uh, one of the downstream tasks for HLS uh, foundation model implementation. And I would like to touch upon the things which uh, were discussed earlier. So something like, what are the responsible AI attributes in the metadata? So if you look here, like who is the data set provider? Who is the data set publisher? What does the data set entails? How you can cite the data? What's the licensing? And then going towards the file description and record description, uh, what's the file object? What does it contain? and details like this. So if you have this metadata and imagine directly using this metadata for training your model, uh, I mean, training as in passing it on as a, to your data loaders, then it makes uh, it, it easier for you to de design the entire workflow. This is another example which we, uh, which shows how geospatial RAI attributes are being defined using the RAI extension. So the RAI attributes like data collection, data collection type, uh, data use cases, all of these are associated uh, with RAI attributes and are equally uh, relevant to Earth observation data sets. So this is again one example and it is available in the RAI specification as well. So questions uh, we have in front of us uh, and we have discussed most of this, like how can GeoCroissant show a common metadata for different resolution, uh, for different spatial resolution, like how do we address that resolution awareness, or how do we address the co-location of multiple satellite images or multiple data sources, and how do, uh, one big problem here is how do we address the domain shift which comes from geo coordinates or variation in geo coordinates. Also, how do we make a global training data set, and how do we sample? Uh, data samples out of it so that the modeling becomes more efficient. So some of these questions might be too challenging for GeoCrossoft. We are still in development phase, but uh, also uh, touching upon the data provenance part and temporal characteristics part. Uh, we discussed about the responsible AI part, which is very equally important. So uh, security and privacy and geospatial biases, how do we address that or how do we address those in machine learning ready data sets? so that you have more confident while training your AI systems that it would not uh, be generating something which is uh, not at par with RAI. And definitely capturing uh, variability at scale. So uh, yeah, how, what's our vision or how do we vision using GeoCrossor? So in the best case scenario, the it could be, uh, it should be useful as a community standard for all the machine learning earth observation data sets. So we would be very happy if you have any ML ready data sets and you can generate a croissant file representation or geo croissant file representation out of it. And uh, if you do that, let us know. Right now it's in development, but once it is done, uh, we look forward to how geo croissant can bring in data fusion related uh, problems and how uh, what's, the, what's the implementation there which can be used. One example is so socioeconomic data, which comes from the census readings or um, all these values, they are mostly generated by uh, human uh, data collectors, plus earth observation data, which is more automated in its generation. How do we combine these? Uh, how do we bring up a minimum list of metadata, which can entail both this information? And uh, yeah, most of the efforts, uh, all of the effort is uh, for open source format. So it's readily available to be useful. And as we discussed, we, uh, we, we talk about how this croissant or geo croissant extension can be used for deploying AI workflows, which gives you an opportunity to do end-to-end -end processing. Oh uh, yeah, as I said, lots to do and we need you. So if you are interested or if you are working in any of these things, uh, I request you all to join the efforts. So right now we are still in the development phase for the specification. Uh, possibly it will it, it should be ready as soon as we have more confidence about the use cases and approaches and with the next release of Crossroad as well. So other things are, uh, GeoCrossant support tools, which is like, so the Crossant ecosystem comes with multiple tools for multiple things. There is Crossant Editor and ML, ML Crossant Python package, which can be useful. 
and uh, uh, there, there are efforts which is required in terms of uh, the geocrossing support as well. Plus, the biggest part is community adoption. So, Earth Observation Machine Learning Ready Dataset Community or Machine Learning Community is diverse and work on a lot of different scientific problems. So, community adoption is something which is really important for us. And if uh, we are also looking forward to have more ML applications using GeoCrossor once it is ready. And last point is interoperability. So, how do we uh, combine everything together in these workflows? So, yes, we make an open call for GeoCrossor Working Group volunteers. If you are interested, uh, please shoot an email to uh, any of us or join the Discord server link, which is provided here. And with that, yeah, these are some resources for Crossor, the original Crossor paper, working group, how to join it. And um, these will be available in the slides. But uh, with that, uh, thank you. And we are ready for your questions. Yeah, thank you, Elena and Rajat. Uh, that was great. Um, Jerica, um, are there any questions in the chat? I don't think so, right? Not that I see, but um, okay. I'm not sure if participants have access to the chat. Okay, uh, maybe we open it up for questions. Okay, there are questions in the chat now. It's starting to show up. Okay, um, can you see the chat, uh, Rajat and Elena? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll let you decide who's gonna answer. I think this is for Rajat, looks like. Yep. So it says the question says why force the Earth observation community to follow understand JSON LD, uh, but keep behind Crossor. If we already have all geo properties very well described in Stack version one point one, a simple JSON easy to follow. The only advantage that I see in Crossor is the more friendly capabilities with some search indexes. Those based on schema.org. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's that's an interesting question, and this is something which has been haunting us too while developing it. Like, <laughs> so uh, we don't want to have another standard which describes the rest of the fourteen other standards. So, uh, with that in mind, interoperability is important. And uh, to answer your question, nobody is forcing anyone. <laughs> but what what we what we are looking forward to is the advantages which uh, are there. So. It, and I'll touch on with the basic ontology 101 course, which I used to attend. It was like, you do not need to have a strict condition where two vocabularies or two standards should have disjointness or should have complete alignment. Each of the vocabularies can cater to certain problems. Each of the metadata can cater to certain problems. And it is okay to have both of them. So with GeoCrossor, we are relying on... Uh, three important things, uh, which are something like, how do we connect these with the conventional or other machine learning data sources, which are non-structured or um, unstructured data sets? Plus, how do we enable data fusion with respect to metadata? And then, uh, how do we incorporate that with the widely used data repositories? So yeah, JSON-LD is at the back, but Somewhere in the uh, somewhere in the future, there will be some effort which will be combining GeoCrossor with all the other uh, specifications as well. And believe me, Stack is a part of it. So uh, how do we interoperate with that? And Elena, if you want to add any point, or Manil, if you want. No, to I think I think you know there's there's always this this discussion that has been going on in the semantic web link data community for for twenty thirty years about why would you need um data descriptions to to be machine understandable uh, to the extent that you know you have unique identifiers you have schemas that are reusable um and the use cases over and over again are um around being able to not just find data in a large uh, decentralized system or even a enterprise system where data is published on different systems and so on and so forth. Um, but it also has to do with, with data integration. Uh, so if uh, data sets are meant to be published and reused in all sorts of purposes and contexts, some of which are not really specified or known at the time of publication, then, then using 
those sort of linked data technologies, semantic web technologies to describe the data um, has, has, has some advantages. But of course, I totally agree with what you said, Rajat, about um, making sure that, that you remain interoperable with, with other standards that the community is using. I've seen also um, um, just a uh, question about pain points that lead to the creation of the new standard. Mm -hmm. So for Croissant in general, I will say that um, the pain points were that people weren't able to process, I mean, they had to change the data before being able to upload it that, uh, or a TensorFlow data set, being able to upload it in a different framework. So that's 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 a pain. Um, also, um, there's the question of, of interoperability across different repositories um, of, 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 of data sets, as well as a number of responsible AI um, use cases, say, um, now, as we have more regulation, as responsible AI practices are are, are becoming more more embedded in in, in, in what we do, um, being able to to think about those workflows and how you could automate them potentially, and how you could um, um, look at data practices in a structured systematic way is, is, is becoming quite important. You will have transparency re reporting for data sets very soon. Um, of course, you could do that manually, uh, but your compliance teams will 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 have something to say about this. And and having that machine readable standard is is is, is, is a way to to address some of those concerns. And I'll I'll let you Rajat um, um, add some of the pain points from um, for the for the geospatial um, uh, case, and there's also um, another question about more specific about data transformations. Yeah, uh, thanks, Elena. And yeah, uh, thank you for the questions. So, with respect to GeoCrossor, the major main point is about discovery, uh, data discovery for machine learning ready data sets, and also how those are incorporated with non-Earth uh, observation or non-geospatial data set. So that is something which uh, is uh, important with respect to uh, the development of GeoCrossor. And I'll quickly take the other question, which is like, uh, will GeoCrossor allow to easily transform data between projections and resolutions? So yeah, uh, thanks, Juan, uh, great question. Right now, we are not looking for any transformations as uh, the metadata description, but it will definitely, uh, so th there's a geotransform property which is defined uh, already in um, uh, the schema.org and that will be used to describe the transformation which was there in original data set. So if you know that, then you can definitely uh, use that for transforming your data to any other uh, data format which you want based on any of the existing libraries. Uh, yeah, there's one uh, more question, Roger. Yeah, I'll take that one as well. So by joining the working group, what is the expected kind of work that has to be done? Uh, thank you, great question. We will not put you on limits to uh, that finish everything, but yeah, just join the working group and decide on your own if you can contribute to any of the things. Uh, we have the deliverables in our mind, uh, the community uh, and the group, which is already there. Uh, uh, and yeah, I'll take this opportunity to shout out to them as well because of all the efforts they are doing. So yeah, if you join to be a part of the working group, we will discuss. And if you want to do a presentation, that is also fine. If you have your own ideas to add to the GeoCrossor use cases or any of the attributes, we will be happy to uh, host a presentation for you. And if you just want to use it or develop it and be a part of the group, then uh, we will be happy to have you as a GeoCrossor or Crossor champion as well. So yeah, just join and let, let us know. Uh, we'll figure it out. All right, I think uh, we are a couple of minutes over our allotted time. So uh, I wanna thank you both for, I know it's late for you and especially and and our, some of our the audience the, meeting now. So I, I'm, oh, okay, I'm, yeah, that's we're right. Going to the meeting. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you go. <laughs> so thank you again. I think and, and thank you to the audience for providing questions. I knew there were a couple of hands raised, and I think it's uh, people in Asia. It's too late for them anyway. So 
I'm sure mm-hmm. we'll continue the conversation and uh, bring you back uh, to answer uh, even more questions as it evolves. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank bye-bye. You.